Welcome to University Unitarian Church. Today is Sunday, December 20th, 2020. I am honored to share worship with you this morning. My name is Melody Moberg, and I am Director of Religious Education at this congregation. Today's worship service is a combination of two annual holiday services the family holiday service and the family candlelight service. These are the two winter holiday services facilitated by the religious education program. This morning, we will celebrate the season with Christmas hymns, live music, and pre-recorded performances by the intergenerational choir and bell choir. We will experience a combination of live worship and pre-recorded offerings from UUC families. Today's service is a tapestry of beloved traditions at this congregation, like Santa Lucia, prayers for peace, and the nativity story. Today's service will close with a pastoral message for families from the Reverend John Luopa. The offering later today and on December 24th will benefit Lake City Partners and Ending Homelessness. Lake City Partners provides a neighborhood network of care for people experiencing homelessness. This includes a winter shelter, a day center, a memorial project, and housing assistance. Today's gifts will be earmarked for Lake City Partners' new 24-7 Recuperative Care Center at the Oaks. On Thursday, December 24th, the pre-recorded Christmas Eve service will be available beginning at 6 p.m. We ask that families attending this service bring a candle for the traditional candlelit singing of Silent Night. Worship on Sunday, December 27th will live stream as usual at 9.30 a.m. Following worship today, all are invited to a conversation with the Board of Directors about the important topic of member engagement. Links to this conversation, more information about Lake City Partners Ending Homelessness, and other virtual coffee hour conversations are available on UUC Connect. Let us begin the service this morning.
These words are from Jennifer Grayson. We light this chalice, symbol of our purpose, to bring more love and justice into the world. We light this chalice, knowing our congregation as a church, dispersed across communities, not bound by walls, but connected through the web of life. Please join in singing our doxology and then singing hymn number 235, Deck the Hall with Basil Paul. This morning, we will hear a collection of prayers for peace from five world religions. Traditionally, we read these prayers as part of UUC's Family Candlelight Service on December 23rd. This year of pandemic calls on us to pray for inner and outer peace. May our traditions, prayers, and candlelight bring meaning and hope during this dark midwinter. A Jewish prayer from the Hebrew Scriptures, Isaiah 2.4. He will judge between the nations and will settle disputes for many peoples. They will beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nation will not take up sword against nation, nor will they train for war anymore. The Peace Prayer of St. Francis from the Christian Tradition Lord, make me an instrument of your peace. Where there is hatred, let me sow love. Where there is injury, pardon. Where there is doubt, faith. Where there is despair, hope. Where there is darkness, light. Where there is sadness, joy. O Divine Master, grant that I may not so much seek to be consoled as to console, to be understood as to understand. To, to be loved as to love. For it is in giving that we receive. It is in pardoning that we are pardoned. And it is in dying that we are born to eternal life. Islamic Prayer 
an Islamic prayer for peace. In the name of Allah the Merciful, praise to the Lord of the universe, who has created us and made us into tribes and nations so that we may know each other, not despise each other. If our enemy inclines towards peace, we must also incline towards peace and trust in God. For the Lord is one that hears and knows all things. The servants of God most gracious are those who walk on the earth in humility. And when we address them, we say, peace. A Hindu prayer for peace. O oh God, lead us from the unreal to the real. Lead us from darkness to light. Lead us from death to immortality. Peace, peace, peace to all. May there be peace in celestial realms. May there be peace on earth. May the waters be appeasing. May herbs be wholesome and may trees and plants bring peace to all. The Four Immeasurables from the Tibetan School of Buddhism. May all beings have happiness and the cause of happiness. May they be free of suffering and the cause of suffering. May they never be separated from the supreme happiness, which is without suffering. May they remain in boundless equanimity, free from both attachment and rejection. Good morning, friends. For many years, the tradition at University Unitarian Church has been uh, to share our Christmas offering with what we call a sharing fund here at UUC. And this fund, its intent is to help members of the congregation who suddenly find themselves in distress or in crisis. And early in the pandemic, we put out a call to you uh, to help us uh, support this fund and you were most generous in your response. So we decided this year that this service and our Christmas Eve service offerings should instead be shared with Lake City Partners, a group working on homelessness in the north end of the city. A remarkable and a wonderful program, and I encourage your generosity to this, which helps men and women and families who are destitute and on the streets to find both warm shelter, meals, uh, bus tickets, uh, memorial uh, gatherings for those who actually uh, end their lives on the streets, and now a whole new effort to uh, repurpose a building uh, for a larger shelter. Many of our members have become involved with this program. Some are even on the board of directors, and it has become an important program for us here. After the service this morning, two of the members most involved with it, uh, Rich Brooks and Judy Erkvitz, will be hosting one of the breakout rooms during the coffee hour period. If you would like to learn more about the program or, to, and, or how to become involved. So we thank you in advance for your generous support of Lake City Partners Ending Homelessness. The collection will benefit their new recuperative care program as we prepare to receive this offering, I ask you now to join me in saying the words we say each week. This church is a community of ourselves. Its energy and resources are our energy and resources. Its wealth is what we share. When we contribute to the life of this community, we affirm our lives within it. Thank you. I want to tell you about Santa Lucia. Before she was Santa or Saint Lucia, she was just Lucia. Lucia was born in Italy in the year 284, during a time when both Jews and Christians were being persecuted by the Romans. Lucia had been raised in the Christian faith. Her parents planned for her to marry, and they set aside a large dowry money that would be given to her husband at her wedding night. Lucia didn't want to marry though, and she turned down the groom her parents had picked for her. She decided to devote her life to helping other people, and she gave away her dowry money to the poor. 
The man Lucia's parents picked for her husband was furious they would not get married and he decided and that he would not receive the dowry. He reported Lucia to the government for being a Christian and she was taken to court and ordered to give up her religion. Lucia refused and was executed by order of the emperor. After her death, the story of Lucia's commitment to her faith spread. She was honored as a martyr and a saint, and people began celebrating her life with a feast day. This feast day happened to overlap with the winter solstice, the shortest day of the year. And so Santa Lucia became a symbol of light during the dark of winter. In Sweden, the Santa Lucia celebration is one of the most important winter celebrations. Early in the morning on December 13th, the eldest daughter of the family dresses as Santa Lucia in a long white gown. She carries a tray of coffee and freshly baked saffron buns to her family, and any other children in the house attend her as star children. Schools and churches in Sweden also have Santa Lucia and star children processionals. And all throughout the day, there are children around the country carrying candles to lighten the darkness. The Santa Lucia tradition is beloved at University Unitarian. Every year during the family candlelight service, there is a Santa Lucia. Santa Lucia is usually a person in middle or high school. While the congregation sings, Santa Lucia leads a procession of star children through the aisles of our chapel, carrying saffron buns and coffee and candlelight in her hair. The star children eagerly follow her, wearing white smocks and holding candles of their own. This is where I want to place you now. Regardless of your age or your gender, for today's meditation, I invite you to close your eyes and imagine yourself as Santa Lucia. You are standing just outside the doors to our chapel. You are wearing a white gown and holding a tray with a teacup and saffron buns in your hands. You are waiting. All at once, the chapel doors open and your procession begins. Up the aisle you walk. The chapel is dark, but it's a sacred kind of dark, the kind that is warm and weighty. And it is filled with the voices of your family and friends. They are singing about Santa Lucia, about her light. As you imagine yourself walking through our chapel, I invite you to imagine the wreath on your head, holding the candles aloft, tall and bright. Can you feel the weight on your head? Imagine for a moment the star children you are leading. These children may carry the light of Santa Lucia in the future. Imagine the children who carried the light of Santa Lucia in the past. In our imagination, they can all be with you in this moment. The Santa Lucia processional does come to an end. The song will fade and you will leave the chapel ready to take off the crown of light, set down the tray and the gown and put on your normal clothes. The star children will take off their own gowns. The crown of light, the tray, and all the gowns will go into a box, ready and waiting for the next year. In this spirit of light and wonder, let us breathe together, holding space for the intentions and prayers left unspoken.
blessed be. Tomorrow is the winter solstice, the longest night of the year. In the midst of this season of short days and long nights, festivals of light emerged to juxtapose the anxiety of living without the sun. Human beings temper gloomy weather with rituals of hope and coziness, celebrating the light of lamps, fires, and candles. The winter solstice calls on celebrants to meditate on the darkness as they also light candles and fires to temper it. Hanukkah and Kwanzaa each celebrate the resilience of marginalized communities through rituals of candlelight. 
Even New Year's brings brightness and newness to this dark season. The Christian celebration of the birth of Jesus in December is not historical, but it is a powerful way to break up the winter. Christmas in December became tradition when Christianity made its way to Europe, melding the celebration of the birth of Jesus with the pagan holiday of Yule. Each year, at this congregation, we tell the story of the birth of Jesus at this worship service. We tell this story for many reasons, for cultural literacy, for a chance to let kids dress up, and because it is a story that has meant something to people for thousands of years. This story speaks to the Christian heritage of our Unitarian and Universalist ancestors. This is a story about people who are unhoused. This is a story about sharing, a story about found family, a story about following a star and fighting an empire. I wonder what parts of this story will speak to you as you hear it today? A young woman named Mary lived in the town of Nazareth in Galilee. Mary was engaged to marry Joseph, a carpenter, who was descended from the house of David. One day, God sent the angel Gabriel to visit Mary. Mary was alone when the angel appeared before her. Greetings, favored one, he said to her. The Lord is with you. Mary was confused and frightened. She struggled to understand what the angel's words meant. Do not be afraid, Mary, he said, for you have found favor with God. You will conceive and bear a child whose name will be Jesus. But how can this be, Mary asked, since I do not have a husband? The Holy Spirit will come upon you, the angel said. The power of the Most High will overshadow you, and the child born to you will be the Holy Son of God. Mary was stunned by these words, but she consented to God's will and said, I am a servant of the Lord. Let everything happen as you have said. And then the angel departed from her. Soon after Joseph and Mary were married, an order came down from the Roman emperor, Caesar Augustus, for all people to return to their birthplaces to be counted and taxed. Although Mary's child was soon to be born, Joseph and Mary began the long journey south to Bethlehem in Judea, the birthplace of Joseph's family. The city was overcrowded when they came to it, and it was hard to find a place to stay. Mary and Joseph walked from inn to inn, but the answer was always the same, I'm sorry, but we have no room. At the last inn Mary and Joseph visited, the innkeeper also told them that sadly he had no room. However, he offered to have them stay in his stables. I know these are humble quarters, he said, but at least you will be out of the rain and cold. Now let us join in singing hymn number 246, O Little Town of Bethlehem.
Though Mary's pregnancy was divine, her labor was human, filled with pain and fear and also love and hope. After many hours, the baby Jesus was born, surrounded by sheep, cows, and goats. Mary and Joseph looked lovingly at their beautiful child. Then Mary wrapped him in swaddling clothes and laid him in the manger. Shepherds were keeping watch over their flocks in the fields nearby. An angel suddenly appeared before them at night. The glory of the Lord shone all around the angel, and the shepherds were filled with fear. The angel said, Do not be afraid. I bring good news of great joy for all people. Unto you is born a Savior, who is Christ the Lord. You shall find him in Bethlehem, lying in a manger. A multitude of angels then appeared, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest heaven, and on earth peace and goodwill among all. The shepherds hurried to Bethlehem. There they found Mary and Joseph and the baby, The shepherds told Mary and Joseph what they had seen, and all were amazed. Meanwhile, three wise men from the east saw a bright, shining star, and they felt compelled to follow it. The star led the men to Bethlehem, and it shone brightly over the place where Jesus lay. When the men saw Mary and the baby, they dropped down onto their knees and worshipped the child with joy. Then they opened their treasure chests, presenting Jesus with great gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. Together, the wise men, the shepherds, Mary, Joseph, and all of the animals celebrated the birth of this special child, the Messiah. Now, let us join in singing the first verse of hymn number 231, Angels We Have Heard on High. During this time of the pandemic and our live streaming services to you beginning in March, one of the bits of feedback we've received from people is, we really miss seeing the children, hearing them in the hallway and having them running and walking around all around us every Sunday morning. And how wonderful it is today uh, to have a service like this uh, put together by our fine religious education staff of parents and children uh, doing what we customarily do at this time of year. And I must say I am touched by it, and I'm sure you are too. So I thank you all, families and children, who have participated in the service this morning. My grandmother was a mischievous woman. And every year, just a few days before my father's 
birthday in January, she would call him by phone. And when he picked up the receiver, he was instantly assaulted by her question, have I ever told you what happened the day you were born in her Finnish English accent? I don't believe so, my father would say. Well, she began, it was two o'clock in the afternoon when I went into labor, and I remember the time because we were downtown about to watch a movie. There had been a terrible winter storm the night before, almost three feet of new snow, and we hurried to get out of the theater before the movie began and into the truck, but it wouldn't start. It was too cold. Finally, the engine kicked over, but the heater wouldn't work, so we drove in the cold truck, and I was frozen, and your father was speeding, slipping and sliding on the ice, and a police officer pulled us over for reckless driving. But when he took one look at my face and my stomach, he threw on his siren and escorted us to the hospital. You had a police escort. Not everyone can say that. And that makes you special. My father grew up on a farm in central Massachusetts. He slept in an attic room as a kid, and there was no heat in the room. On winter evenings, he enjoyed watching his breath in the cold air. And his father, who was a no-nonsense guy, would holler up the stairs, Good night, son. Good night. But his mother would creep up the steps, sit on his bed, and ask him quietly, Have I ever told you the story of what happened the day you were born? I don't believe so, my father would respond. And so she would grab one of her knees lean back and tell him the same story. And over the course of my father's growing up and even into adulthood, he had heard this story dozens and dozens of times. When the Second World War began, my dad was a teenager and itching to get off that farm he enlisted in the Navy, having lied about his age. And sometimes at night, before he fell asleep on his ship, he smiled within that South Pacific, remembering that day, sitting in that old Ford truck, and during the New England cold, his mother and father in order to bring him into the world, and his wanderlust would be chastened just temporarily. After all, he had arrived with a police escort, and no one else in the neighborhood had so great an honor. My father always cherished the gift of that story. His parents could provide neither wealth nor connection to ease his way into life. But the story was the greatest consolation. Hearing my grandmother tell this story about my father's birth piqued my interest in the story of my own arrival. I think I was about seven years old when I asked my father to tell me the story about my birth. And my dad paused for a minute as if lost 
deeply in reverie. I got a little nervous, thinking maybe my birth wasn't exceptional at all. Maybe it was just normal. But then he began, yours was a very special birth. A quite miraculous birth, really. It was early in May. It had been raining for days like a demon. And your mother went into labor and we dashed to the hospital. There had been some flash flooding and the roads were very slick. And we rounded a curve and I was going too fast and the car turned over and rolled down the hill. Oh, we were both dazed and your mother was pinned in the car. But I got out, lit a fire so somebody would see where we were. And a passing plane saw us and we were rescued within hours. And the ambulance took us quickly to the hospital where you were safely delivered. And that, my boy, is the story of your birth. Wow! Oh, ho, ho, I swelled with pride. Tell me again. Tell me again, I said. Oh, no, not till next year. And he shooed me away as my mother approached. What were you talking about? She asked. I was telling him about the day he was born, my father answered. Well, did you tell him how the nurse had to pull you away from the book of haunting stories you were reading so that you could see your firstborn child? Well, sort of, said Dad. I hope you're not filling his head with nonsense. And the next day, my father secretly requested that I not ask my mother about the day of my birth because it was too traumatic for her to recall. And I never asked her until years later. We were at my grandparents' house for dinner. And my grandmother, my sweet mumu, now becoming blessedly forgetful, asked my father in front of everyone seated at the table, have I ever told you the story about the day you were born? I don't believe so, my father automatically replied. And my grandmother regaled us with the old, old story, whereupon my grandfather said, What policeman? What snow? Come on, Grandpa, I said. You know, the one who brought you to the hospital. Remember, there were mountains of snow all over the place. The truck wouldn't start. The heater wouldn't work. Grandma was freezing. Freezing? He exclaimed. We were in the middle of a January thaw. There was no snow. It was very mild. And she wouldn't go to the hospital until the movie was over because she had a deep crush on Rudolph Valentino. So much so that she even named you after him. And I looked at my father, and he nodded and winked at me, and he said, nothing. No frozen grandmother, no police escort, but it was my dad's story, true or not, and he really cherished it. They could not give him wealth or connections to ease his way into the world. But he did have a story bestowed with love and sustained by delight. In the last few weeks of my grandmother's life, I returned home from graduate school to accompany my father to visit the nursing home where my grandmother lived. Even though her mind then lived mostly 
in the Finland of her childhood. She told my dad, the only child of hers to survive, that story one last time. She always ended it by saying, not everyone gets a police escort. That makes you special. And with all my so-called education and Ivy League sophistication, I finally appreciated how important it was to pass a story from one generation to another. Wealth, fame, connections cannot make us who we are. We have only these legends to remind our children that on the day they were born, the ordinary was suspended and the miracles flew thick. We gather now in this season, as countless millions of people have done before, to hear again the story of an extraordinary birth. Whether we be among the literal-minded or the sweepingly skeptical, whether we be childlike in our apprehension or scoured by cynicism, Christmas would not be Christmas without the story of a babe wrapped in bands of cloth, warmed by the breath of animals, sung to by angels, visited by shepherds and kings, and adored by two exhausted and bewildered parents. The child is cause for wonder and gratitude, life's deepest hope for itself. And that, my dear friends, makes it special, always. So may it be. Merry Christmas. The religious educator Sophia Lyon Foz proclaims, each night a child is born is a holy night. A time for singing, a time for wondering, a time for worshiping. As we close our time of worship together, of peace prayers, lighting candles, and traditions. May we carry forth from this service the blessings of community, the gift of wonder, and the perennial wisdom that this night, too, is holy. May it be so, and blessed be.